tell you, I couldn't ask for a better introduction than that. I trust and obey. Let's think a little bit about believing tonight. What do you believe? How much do you believe? How strong do you believe? Just some thoughts that come across the mind, and uh, I'll look with me to John 1. And uh, I want to read the seven, I want to read seventeen verses out of that first chapter of John, which contains the twelfth verse, which is my favorite life verse, and I just thoroughly enjoy it, that verse and delight in it. But uh, that's not really my focus tonight. That uh, oh, now let me t- let me turn my volume down just a little. I'm loud. I'm a little bit extra loud to myself, and. Uh, so bear with me just a minute, and I'll see if I can get this uh, stuff to cooperate. Yeah, I think that's better. And uh, I'll, but beginning in John one, and if you want to stand with, stand as we read the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness overcame overcame it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was, to, that was the true light that lights every man that comes into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried, saying, This was he whom I spoke. He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus. Father, we love you and praise you and thank you for your word. And now, Lord, we just, as we look at it and think about it a little bit, Lord, we just give us the words to say, and, and may we receive your message from you, and we'll give you praise and glory, Lord Jesus. Amen. Thank you, and be seated. <clears throat> in that portion of scripture, John sums up from the creation to Jesus. He covers a broad amount of scripture and, and as he sums this up for us. And at the beginning of his uh, book that he wrote that we call the book of John. And uh, <clears throat> oh, but he, he begins with a beginning, the, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's the first thing we got to believe? God. God. With no God, nothing. Nothing. And then he goes on, uh, well, the Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And we know by a little more study that that was the Godhead, the uh, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit was all involved in that. And I can't explain the Trinity. It's all in one, but one and all. And that's about, about as all this uh, country boy can come up with. And you know, it's not, a lot of folks want to disagree and argue and fuss about that. Just believe. Just believe. Just accept God's word on his face and relax and enjoy it. And then as one of the songs said, obey. Obey. It's important that we learn God's word and obey it. 
The same was in the beginning with God. Everything was in the beginning with God. He spoke the world into existence and everything in it. And the Lord Jesus was right there with him and involved in that. And in fact, some scripture said he was the creator. So he was part of creation and being created. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. God created all. All that we have belongs to him. He's just loaning it to us. And uh, <clears throat> in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Oh, now we're getting down to where it affects us. Yeah, light that lights our way. You know, I'm, I'm still mystified at the working of the Holy Spirit to bring us to salvation. One of those things that, beyond my explanation, I, I, I know it happens. And I know it happens to others, and I see it happen, and praise the Lord for it happening. But to explain how it all works, I don't have a clue. And uh, as to tell you, why one man sit and listen to a message and the Holy Spirit deals with his heart and when the invitation is given, he can't wait to get out of the pew. And another guy hear the same message and it's like water rolling off a duck's back. Nothing. Don't affect him, doesn't change him, doesn't have anything to do with it. But when the light shines in the darkness, the darkness got to go. Darkness has got to go. If the, if you know why, why are we, why is there no darkness in this room? The lights are on. Now, out at our place a few minutes ago, all of a sudden it went dark. <laughs> power cut. <clears throat> Probably a tree fell on a power line up there somewhere between us and the, and the Crawfords. Well, it was communicating with Janelle there after we got to the church, and and uh, you know Travis had uh, while I'm mentioned them. Travis had was scheduled to have hip replacement surgery tomorrow morning at uh, St. Vincent's and he's got a lung infection so they delayed it now, put it over into June. So I uh, asked several of you to pray for him and, and all, but it's off till June. But keep praying for him. Pray to get over this uh, lung infection. He has a, a lung problem from that's severe anyway and also it's uh, a try a Troubling thing for them, I know, and you uh, know. But when the light's on, the darkness is gone. When lightness comes into our life, the darkness has got to flee. Now it don't mean it won't keep trying to come back. You know, the temptations come, and we, that's where our will gets involved is resisting those temptations. And when we fail to resist, then. We've got to confess, get our life cleaned up again. First John 1, 9 talks about if we're faithful and just and, and confess our sins and he is faithful and forgives us. But the confession is up to us. Confession is up to us. In him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shined in darkness and the darkness overcame it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. Yes, all men, all of us have an opportunity to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I've along the way, I've had folks say, well, what about them folks that never heard? Well, in most cases, I can look back and find out where somewhere back yonder they had the gospel. And somebody failed to keep it up and maintain it and keep it fresh on the, uh, in that nation, and then consequently it was lost. So I think this, uh, that either they've had the opportunity or they will have the opportunity. Now, there could have been some failings there that create the, what appears to be not an opportunity, but... God knows about all that, and that's, he's got that all worked out. It's not up to me to figure it all out. I don't have to do that. That's, that's what, the, what the president says above his pay grade. Well, that's way above this country boy's pay grade. 
uh, just a country redneck and a lot of things above my pay grade. <clears throat> then the, the next verse we get to is <clears throat> that verse 12 that I talked about. As many as receive him. Yes, God made a gift available by the sacrifice of his only begotten son. The only human that's had birth by a woman that was fathered by God. Only one. And because of that, he didn't have the sin that those fathers pass on to our kids. God had no sin to pass on to, to him. So, That was the sacrifice when he sacrificed his son, died in our place. That made available to us the gift of salvation, but it has to be received. It has to be received. Any gift is, is in, in essence, is no gift if you won't receive it. You get no benefit from it. I could go down to the bank and open a, a bank account in your name, put money in it, give you the papers to it and all that, but if you never go draw the money out, you never get any benefit from it. And our salvation is, is available, but we have to receive it. Somewhere back there, you know, back, well, I think on July the 15th, the year that I turned 30 years old, was the day that I received Jesus as my Savior. Went to a revival service that evening, and the preacher preached, and I have no clue what he preached. I don't remember a thing, but I know I went home, and I couldn't go to sleep. And I finally told Lucy, get up and get your Bible. I got to settle this. And I don't remember what scriptures we looked at, but I got down beside that bed, and I invented, invited the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart and my life to be my Savior and place my trust in him. Amen. See, that was, that was where I was hung up for years, was that turning it over to him, placing the trust in him. And until we trust him, we don't, it don't get done. It's up to us to trust What did John do? He said, who would... <clears throat> well, if, if Scripture goes on from, I read verse 12. Then we go into 13. said, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God does the birthing of the Christian. He's the one that adopts us into his family, I guess we could say. He'd use that term, use it loosely. But he came in... You know, it wasn't, wasn't a flesh thing. You know, I was thinking about this a few days ago. I don't know what prompted me to think about it, whether I read or somebody mentioned it. Some, but what happened to Judas? Yes, Karen. How in the world could a man spend three years with Jesus and not believe? But that's what happened. That's what happened. He never trusted him. For some, some, uh, you know, it's beyond my speculation, I guess it's what. I think he loved the Lord in a sense that he, he thought was looking for him to open, to start to open the, his kingdom. Like the Jew, that was a Jewish philosophy of that day. I guess that term's all right to use. And that, that uh, and all, he followed. He was, seems to have been obedient. He was a trusted member of the 12 because he carried the money. He took care of the money. So we, it, 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 probably if you looked at Judas's life up till the day that he went and, uh, Deceived or our Lord, or told them how to get go get him. 
whatever term you want to use there. But up till then, if you compared his life, you'd have thought he was as, as, probably as good as anybody in the 12. But yet, he never truly believed and really believed. Now, <clears throat> I believe this. If he, even after he had done what he'd done, when he realized how terrible it was, if he'd have went and said, Lord, forgive me. Lord, forgive me. I believe he'd have been forgiven just like Peter was forgiven after denying the Lord three times. Now, I can't prove that by scripture, I don't think. But that's redneck philosophy, I guess, or belief that that could have, could have been. I believe he could have been saved. One reason I believe that is the scripture tells us it's not the will of the Lord that any perish. So if you're going to, you know, you go, when you try to reconcile some of these things, it's tough to try to figure them out. But that seems to be, you know, I think that's the case that he repented of what he'd done. Then Jesus would have forgave him. I don't think he would have, would have been condemned to teetotally. You know, <clears throat> John bore witness of him and cried, saying, This was he whom I, of whom I spoke. He that comes after me is preferred before me, for he, for <clears throat> for he was before me, and, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by the Lord. Jesus Christ. Oh, grace, that, that marvelous grace. Wondrous grace, how does the song go? Uh, uh, and, but it is, how marvelous and wonderful it is. So believe, believing faith. I, was, I got to wondering, well, what does the dictionary say about faith? If you, if you really want a good di dictionary definition of faith, you got to go back and pick up a dictionary that's old. I've, I've got a copy on the computer of Webster's 1828 edition. And his fourth, I won't bore you with all that he said because there's probably two pages of, that he wrote about faith. But the fourth definition he gives, evangelistically, justifying or saving faith is the ascent of the mind to the truth of divine revelation. On the authority of God's testimony, accompanied with a cordial ascent of the will or appropriation of the heart, an entire confidence or trust in God's character and declaration and in the character and doctrines of Christ with an unreserved surrender of the will to his guidance and dependence on his merit for salvation. In other words, that firm belief of God's testimony and the truth of the gospel which influences the will and leads to an entire reliance on Christ for salvation. The modern Webster's Dictionary has not a word in it and about faith that would lead you to even think about Christ. Sad as it is, but that's the truth. There are different levels of faith. Scripture speaks of little faith, increased faith, and great faith. Matthew 6, 30, 34, therefore God's so clothe the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or how shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all, th all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take no, take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought of the things for itself. 
Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof, Luke 17, 5. And the apostle said unto the Lord, increase our faith, Matthew 8, 5 through 10. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lies at home sick, a paralytic, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say unto this man, Go, and he goes. And to another, Come, and he comes. And to my servant, Do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Faith grows by the word and is perfected by being tested and put into action. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. The testing of our faith produces patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire wanting, lacking nothing. James 1, 4. Do we use our faith? A recent article in Baptist Press talked about a LifeWave research project that they did with pastors. One of the questions was, what's the biggest problem your church faces today? 47% apathy. Apathy. 47% find people's apathy or lack of commitment the most challenging people dynamic among Protestant pastors. I think think they did did that study last year. This is what we believe. Our apathy is keeping us from spreading the word about our wonderful Savior. And I... I had to say, after reading that and thinking about that and studying this, I had to stop and think about how much how much has apathy gotten to me? And I began to recount and think about things I used to do that I don't do anymore or haven't done in a while. And I thought, my, I'm not doing what I ought to do anymore. Oh, I was rolling along with the tide, you know, but so far as being outgoing with my faith or doing anything to increase my faith, I still read my Bible every day, still have a little prayer time every day, but there's just so many, so many things. I, I, don't, I don't witness like I used to witness. I look back and I think, well, I used to carry a pocket full of tracks. It's been years since I've done that. But, you know, it doesn't take much effort to give a track out or to leave a track somewhere for somebody to find it and think, well, God must be looking for me if he left that here for me to find. Now, I don't know, you know, I I worked in a hospital when uh, I was in school in Louisville at Valley Station uh, Church where we went to church uh, at Beth Haver Baptist Church where we went to school <clears throat> and I always carried a track or two in my pocket even, even at work and all and once in a while I'd lay one up somewhere in the restroom or here and there and uh, there was the, the, the hospital custodians hated tracks because there were groups that come through and they'd just pile a pile of tracks up on a table or somewhere and it just wound up being a mess that they had to clean up. So the, the hospital had a policy against tracks. We were working on the front door of the hospital there one day. They had automatic doors and the doors wasn't functioning right and they had the, almost a whole maintenance crew up there trying to get that door straightened out. Well, I 
took a break and went to the restroom, and I left a track laying up on the top of the towel rack. Went on back out to work. Didn't think anything about it. And in a little bit, cop came out. Cop was the head security man. And we all called him cop. That was his nickname. I never didn't know the guy's name, but I know of him. But anyway, he come out and there, and he, I don't know who he was talking to, but he said, them folks with them tracks at back, I got to go upstairs. And away he went. Well, he'd found my tr track in that restroom. <laughs> I just smiled to myself and, and went on. But, uh, I, you know, for years I'd done that. I'd leave a track in the, up in the rack at the grocery store or somewhere back on the shelf that I was like, somebody had to, had to find it. It wasn't just going, it wasn't just out in the open and all. And I find that to be a good way to pass the word on. Now you don't, a lot of times you never know if you get any results for that. But at the same time, you read, if you read much Christian publications, you find out that a lot of folks get saved reading tracks. And, uh, at least they get focused or get pointed the right direction and, and also. But that just, I had, I thought, well, I'm just not on top of my game like I used to be. And I had to confess it and, uh, and say, I was not practicing all I believe anymore. And that's apathy. Or all I know, and that's apathy. So we need our faith increased. We need forgiveness for our apathy and put it aside and get busy building the church and being obedient to the Lord. Thank you very much. That'll be the only verse I can think of to go with that is what James said, and he said, faith without